The landscape of downtown Columbus has changed quite a bit from its early days. Yet, in the midst of all the new development, a few iconic places have remained. Or, in the case of our next story, a sign. Producer George Levert visits the Peanut Shop to find out more about its history. We are here with Pat Stone. Her and her husband, Mike, own the peanut shop down here, downtown Columbus. And we're just gonna talk about the history of the peanut shop a little bit. Pat, so glad to have you with us. Thank you, thanks for having me. Tell me a little bit about the history of, of this peanut shop. Well, this was originally a planter's peanut shop. Planters opened stores beginning at the turn of the 20th century. And at one point, when planters sold everything to standard brands, there were over 300 stores like mine across the United States. Standard Brands, which was bought by Nabisco, which sold planters to R.J. Reynolds, who sold planters to Heinz Craft Foods, and then last, uh, about a year and a half ago, Heinz Craft sold planters to Hormel. Luckily for us, two golf buddies from the Akron-Canton area bought the store from Standard Brands, and my husband and I bought it from them. So we're very close to being what the old store was. What made you really say peanut shop is a good investment for us to, to get into? It's a fun story. In 1972, I know it's over 50 years now, I can't believe it, my husband graduated high school and he needed a job to take me on dates to Burger King. So for $1.50 an hour, he wore the peanut costume that we have in the corner. He was tall and thin then, uh, now he says we've washed that costume so many times it doesn't fit when in fact it's close to 50 years of my cooking that is the, the issue. When Mike's managers retired, the owners asked Mike to manage the store and he did for a few years. And six years later, the owners wanted to sell it and offered it to us and we bought it outright. So we've owned the store since July of 1996, but it's been a part of our lives since we were kids. Tell me a little bit about the, the sign. That sign has been the attraction for that years. That sign is amazing. It's truly one of a kind. There are no others in existence like him. Uh, the sign came with the store in 1936. He's been in every picture of all three locations that I've ever found over the years. You shared with me a little bit of a story before we started about former President Jimmy Carter years ago and yeah, your husband. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for the, the May primary, before the general election in 1976, Jimmy Carter was gonna hold a huge rally on the State House lawn, and it was packed. When you have a contender for president coming, it packs the lawn. The Carter people called the local Dems and said, is there any way to tie in the peanut farmer aspect? And they said, well, we got this college kid that walks around downtown dressed like an eight foot Mr. Peanut. And they said, well, get him if you can. So they called Mike's manager and he goes, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And I took the afternoon off work, picked up Michael at school, he was going to Columbus State at the time, and brought him downtown. He put on the peanut costume. We got cleared through Secret Service and the first person to greet Jimmy Carter as he stepped out of that big black town car was my husband in the peanut costume. And Mike handed him a one pound bag of freshly roasted peanuts, just like we roasted yesterday. And so we have pictures of Mike with Jimmy Carter giving us that big Jimmy Carter grin. Pat, I can remember when I was young, uh, my grandma and I would come downtown and she would run errands down here. And I think the peanut shop was down further uh, north at that time than it is now. But she, we would come out of the, there was a Woolworth across the street, a soda fountain. We would come out of there and if I was, if I acted like she would, as she would say, if I acted like I had some sense, then we'd come across the street to, to the peanut shop and I could get something from here. You probably went to our very first location, which was at Five South High. Uh, Planters opened that store in 1936. We were there until 1978. Um, that store was tiny. I mean, they actually had to take the uh, stock in through the, through the sidewalk, an opening in the sidewalk, and store it in the basement. It was very small. In 1978, the Huntington Bank bought all three little buildings between the bank and Broad Street. So we had to move. 
So our second location, we moved one, one block north, was at 46 North High Street on, the, on this side of, of the street. And we were there from 1978 until 2014 when we moved down here at um, 21 East State Street at the corner of State and High Streets. All three locations have been good uh, at different points in time. This location is particularly good because of our proximity to the Ohio Theater and the state office workers. And an interesting story too is um, you mentioned that if you acted like you had sense, your grandmother would bring you to the store. Yeah. I hear similar stories all the time. <laughs> I've heard stories about uh, children coming into, our families coming into Columbus to do shopping for school clothes. And if they behaved while they were in Lazarus, the peanut shop was their next stop. Yes. If they didn't, they didn't get to go to the peanut shop. So we've been used as, um, you know, bribery and <laughs> pretty much anything else you can imagine. And I, I love hearing that. I love hearing the continued history. I love it when somebody comes in and says, this is my granddaughter and I'm bringing her here because my grandmother brought me. So it's, it's we're part of the community. Pat, I see an, an old roasting machine. Is, is that, are you still using that? Are you still using an old roasting machine? Absolutely, it's a wonderful machine. Our peanut roaster was actually made to be a coffee roaster. It was made by the Royal Roaster Company. It's their number five machine. The only thing that planters did to convert it from a coffee roaster to a peanut roaster is they took the Art Deco designs off the corners and put Mr. Peanuts on the machine. So it's a very simple machine. This one actually came with the store in 1936. It twirls like clothes in a clothes dryer, the peanuts do. And after about 40 minutes, they're perfectly done. No additives, no preservatives, pure peanuts. What, what, what is your daily operation? How do you get started each day with peanuts? And, you know, oh, but first thing we do when we come in is turn on the cooker and then see what's low. What do we need to cook for today? And very often, you know, people will come in and smell the smell that you smelled and ask us what's hot. Oh, the, the mammoth cashews are hot. Pecans are hot. And they sell like hot cakes at that point. You have bags uh, ready to go right there too, but we do. You. As soon as we as soon as we roast the peanuts, we bag them in in different sizes. There's pound, half pound, quarter pound, and two ounces, and we then put them in a warming bin so they stay warm all the time. So maybe I roasted yesterday, but when you come in the store and you buy the peanuts, you're going to carry them out while they're still warm. Tell me a little bit about some of your top sellers, some of your, what you have to offer. Sure. When it comes to chocolates, chocolate peanuts and pecan turtles are king. So all the others are, are excellent. You know, we still have uh, a, a large selection of dark chocolate covered nuts and candies, as well as the milk chocolate. Old favorites, you know, when, when you were a kid and you go to the movies and you get some Boston baked beans or French burnt peanuts, you're still getting those. Younger people that are coming in, uh, like uh, the Swedish fish and gummy bears, things that weren't around when I was a kid. But I eat them now, that's for sure. When it comes to the nuts, any peanut is popular. Uh, uh, hard white peanuts, Spanish peanuts, the red skin peanuts, we have all three. Uh, we do carry unsalted as well as salted nuts to meet dietary needs of folks. Um, cashews, you know, you just can't beat them. Pat, I know that downtown has changed. Who are your customers now? My customers are the regulars who are still coming into the office, but maybe only one or two days a week. Downtown has changed dramatically. You know, we're seeing a lot of restaurants that depend on lunch traffic are, are simply closing or reducing their hours. And it's hard. It's hard to actually know what's going to happen next. But for right now, we're seeing a huge drop in walk traffic. Peanut shop is here. Downtown has changed. A lot, a lot of businesses are gone. Yeah. But you're still standing. What is? What do you think the future is for Peanut Shop? I think the Peanut Shop will be around for as long as people want it to be. Maybe not under 
my uh, control or care, but I, I think it's a viable business. And the reason it, it's lasted so long, I mean, my store was opened in 1936. We're going into our 87th year, is because we can adapt and adjust. A lot of history, a lot of nostalgia, and good. Good product. Good product. Excellent yeah. product. Pat, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Downtown Columbus has some great historic buildings, like the State House, the Levesque Tower, and the Ohio Theater. But have you ever noticed or even wondered about the more modern buildings around them? I know I have. Next, architectural historians Jeff Darby and Nancy Ritchie take us on a walking tour of modern architecture in downtown Columbus. <laughs> Well, this is driving with Darby, but today I think we're going to do some walking. It's the best way to see what we're going to look at, which is modern architecture in downtown Columbus. A lot of people think of modern architecture mostly as high-rise office buildings. They're sort of the, the symbol of, of modern architecture in our country. We've got some great examples here in Columbus, in fact, some, some groundbreaking examples. It's wonderful when you can cover just a small amount of ground and actually do an architectural history lesson at the same time. So this will be an interesting day, an afternoon in downtown Columbus, looking at some of our iconic buildings. So crossing Capitol Square, we'll go to the um, southeast corner of Broad and High because it's a really good view of some of these buildings we've been talking about. It's the best place to begin because we see the early buildings right. there. Right. And then as we walk around, we can go through the decades and talk about the changes in architecture. Well, in the Wyandotte building, the, the first skyscraper in Columbus, first to use the steel frame, really didn't follow very long after the steel frame was first introduced in Chicago. Exactly, people associate skyscrapers with New York City. Yeah. But the birthplace is Chicago. It's a Midwestern invention coming really on the heels of the Chicago fire. Right. And the, I guess, happy coincidence of perfecting the mass production of structural steel and really the elevator because who was going to walk up 10 or 20 flights of stairs? Right. So it was the combination of technology that allowed these dense downtown areas to develop. Well, the State House, of course, was old construction. You stack stone upon stone to build a bearing wall structure. Right there, yep. Right across the way, you've got the Ohio Theater, which looks the same way. It looks as though you stacked up stones to create it. In fact, it has a steel frame with a masonry exterior. It's a modern building in that sense. Next to the theater is the former Beggs Building yep. with a fifth third tower added to it, similar in style. You have the um, Reif State Office Building. You have the uh, Huntington Bank Building. One of my favorites. Yes, uh, really it's from 1984, so that's fairly late in the skyscraper era here in downtown Columbus. So here we are right in front of Capitol Square, which gives us a great view of how Capitol Square is the center of a lot of different architectural styles. So just taking a look around, uh, you know, it covers a lot of periods, literally from 1897 to 19, what, 2000? Yeah, Probably it, 2000 with these textbook. buildings. So just over my shoulder to the left is the uh, Rhodes Tower from 1974. And then early skyscrapers, really the number eight building and number 16 next to it. And those were designed by Frank Packard. So a prominent uh, Columbus architect. And those are on Broad Street. On Broad Street. And they were built as office buildings. Exactly. Uh, and and uh, Peter Hayden was associated with one of them. He was a Columbus industrialist. He had coal mines. He built Haydenville. So people important in the city are associated with some of these buildings. And then you see the Levesque Tower peeking out behind the Huntington Building. And the Levesque really was the building that changed the city skyline right. in 1927. A lot of people think it looks kind of like the, the Empire State Building with that telescoping design. Mm -hmm. It predates. The Empire, Before the Empire State, State Building. Building. It is right. earlier than the Empire State Building. And it was Building. built by an insurance organization called the American Insurance Union. Yes. And it was called the AIU Citadel. 
Yes. Uh, but they went bankrupt after a couple of years, having spent so much Probably on the building. Probably buying, yes, yeah. building the building. <laughs> and the right. depression didn't help the didn't stock help. market crash. So behind you is the Huntington Building. And one of the things I love about that, not just the elegant materials, uh, but the way the uh, facade really kind of steps back and there, it was done for corner offices with a great view of Capitol Square. But if you see those cross pieces, those structural pieces, right. those are multi-story atrium sections stacked. So it really opens up to the outside, to the view, very, very different than any other skyscraper building in Columbus. And it really is because of this great view and a great reflection of the Ohio State House in that very center section. It really section. is, and I think it was planned Designed that for that location. Yeah, it definitely was. Well, there's more to see, up more up toward the corner of Broad and High. So we're still on Capitol Square. We're approaching the corner of uh, East Broad, South Third Street. Yep, and this is a great opportunity to see how Broad Street changed over time. So um, we're looking at, right behind us with the Chase Bank, that was yes. the first modern skyscraper in Columbus. And what made it so important was it actually had a sunken plaza. It originally had a big fountain in front of it. That was the New York corner of Columbus when it was built in 1965. That's what was happening in New York City. Very much that, influenced uh, by the Seagram building and other really early landmark buildings in New York, where New York City gave bonus points for plazas and space in front so of buildings. So you see how ideas like that kind of got transmitted across the country. It was the latest modern other. thing. Within a decade, uh, you had the building behind us, the PNC building. And the interesting thing about PNC, it's almost a little mini uh, Sears Tower in terms of the massing of the building. But look at the, uh, the very dark glass lower. Why was that, do you think? Well, it was to feature the, feature the building, but it was also a public space. There, I remember there was a restaurant in there. Yes. People may remember this building as the Ohio National Bank building, right. later Bank Ohio, now PNC. It goes back to the mid-1970s. And the Galleria that was built around Trinity Church. Now, Trinity Church is one of those anchors in Capitol Square, uh, 1869, Parish House from 1910, a real landmark and, and still very vital. So landmark. the architects actually designed this low, dark glass portion to really be in scale and not compete with Trinity Church. And then the building rises behind it. And people wouldn't realize that that is connected to that big white multi-tiered uh, building right behind. It's so it really took apparent. up almost a whole block. And it's interesting, this was corporate architecture because we're calling these buildings the names of the banks that built them and the businesses that built right, them. Right. It was City National Bank, now Chase. It was Ohio National, now PNC. It was the Borden Building. It was the Midland Building, the Motorist Building. Right. They were the corporate headquarters for these buildings. And they were making a statement with their architecture that they were modern. Mm -hmm. You know, they had beautiful bank buildings that were very solid, very early 20th century. This was the looking forward um, from a corporate standpoint, but also very much adding to the city and the idea of skyline representing a city of the 20th century. Well, that's a good point because they were making a commitment to downtown Columbus yes, they at a were. time when the city was really beginning to spread yes. out into the suburbs. This still was the heart of the city. Solidly. And they wanted to show that they were committed to the heart of the city. And that continued. We have the nationwide building. We have the Huntington building. We have the AEP building. Right, right. So that was, that was something that really started in the mid uh, 20th century and continues even today. Well, it's been quite a day for lesson in architectural history, hasn't it's it? It's a beautiful day to be out and walking around and enjoying the city and its rich, rich architecture. Union Station in downtown Columbus used to be a main transportation hub for people coming in and out of town. Amtrak was one of the more notable railroads that came through. One viewer wondered whatever happened to Amtrak, so our producers over at Curious Seabus decided to dig into that story. Curious Seabus is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. Today's question is from Megan Steva. 
She asked, why is Columbus the largest metropolitan area in the country without Amtrak service? And when did we lose rail service in the first place? First, a little history. Rail service began in Columbus in the 1850s. In 1897, construction of the majestic Union Station was completed, and for the next 80 years, travelers were served by several railroads. Amtrak took over the Pennsylvania Railroad route, known as the Spirit of St. Louis, in 1971, and later renamed it the National Limited. That line ran through New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Dayton, Indianapolis, St. Louis, and Kansas City. But by that point, ridership was on the decline and decaying tracks led to frequent delays in service. Then, in October of 1976, a large section of the arcade at Union Station was demolished. The station continued to serve rail passengers for a time, but that was really the beginning of the end. Finally, due to federal budget cuts and a lack of profitability, Amtrak discontinued the National Limited in 1979. Columbus hasn't had a passenger rail since. Now as to the question of why Columbus still doesn't have passenger service 40 years later, it seems to be a matter of public support and political will. A decade ago, there was a big push to bring passenger rail back to Columbus with the so-called 3C Corridor. The plan would have connected Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. Democratic Governor Ted Strickland pushed for the new line, and $400 million federal dollars were allocated for the project. But in the 2010 election, Ohioans voted in Republican John Kasich. He killed the plan over concerns that the line would be too expensive and wouldn't draw enough riders. Those $400 million transportation dollars were sent to other states. Though that plan failed, two new plans to bring high-speed travel to town are currently being considered. One is an Amtrak high-speed train line between Chicago and Columbus with stops in Indiana and Ohio. The other more futuristic idea is for a Hyperloop, a new form of transport where pods carrying freight or passengers travel on magnetic tracks inside a vacuum-sealed tube. The Hyperloop could potentially reach speeds exceeding 500 miles per hour. In 2017, Columbus was named a finalist in a global search for possible locations. A proposed route from Pittsburgh to Chicago through Columbus is currently being studied. So though you won't be able to buy a ticket anytime soon, there is hope for Central Ohioans who want to ride the rails again. Do you have a question for Curious Seabus? Head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us, and remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. I remember old Columbus and the places I used to go. The banks of the old Entangy and the people I used to know. I remember the old Scioto in the early days of June, where the families all would gather on a Sunday afternoon. I remember down on Broad Street, where the old state house she stands, and the people in the park grounds feeding pigeons from their hands. I remember old German village and the streets of cobblestone and the ancient houses all still there to welcome old timers home. And coming into Columbus I remember a sight with all the shining, speeding highways and the marvel that I saw. The places in old Columbus are very dear to me, but the fondest memory that I have is the university. Down 
on the old and old university hall and to my pain with much disdain the bells of Orton Hall roll old and tangy roll old and tangy roll old and tangy you river of memory woman your soul shattering shadowy as a black cat's soul woman if it don't matter then pack your bags mama let it all go woman you bleed but you don't die your strength is in your lullaby Rivers made when you cry, God save us from the storm. One your soul shattering. One your soul shattering. Bearing down low, test of the ages, bringing forth thieves and lovers and sages, bringing them up. She can, woman, your soul shattering. Flesh of my flesh, your body blessed. Drops in the tongue from your milky breast.